morning and welcome on this third Sunday in Lent. Uh, we continue to follow our Lord on his way to the cross for us and for our salvation. Today we follow service number four on page 203 in your Lutheran service book. Also the bulletin that you've received. Once again, we will do the self, uh, self-serve format with Holy Communion today. And on Wednesday, we gather for our fourth midweek service, um, Cross Talk, the Seven Words. And so this Wednesday, we will consider the words, Today, you will be with me in paradise. So once again, uh, we thank Jennifer for helping us with the music today. Uh, She will plan to sing one and three, and then we can join in on two and four. And... uh, We can all sing together verse 5, or, yes, verse 5 when there is a verse 5. May the Lord bless our worship and communion. We begin with the opening hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. forgiveness. Therefore, you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves 
from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, in holy baptism, you declared us to be your children and gathered us into your one holy church, in which you daily and richly forgive us our sins and grant us new life through your Spirit. Be in our midst, enliven our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And by the authority of Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now we speak the words of the Kyrie, Lord, Lord have mercy. Christ, Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy. The Lord be with you. And, and also with you. We pray. O God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways, and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith, to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word, <coughs> through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated now for the hearing of the Lord. Uh, the Old Testament reading comes to us from the 20th chapter of the book of Exodus. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is, that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land, that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now we pray responsibly from Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky proclaims his handiwork. Day to day, day, day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their, their measure line goes out through all the earth. And their words to the end of the world, and then he has set the tent for the sun. 
which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. His rising, rising is from the end of the heavens, and, and, heavens, and his circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from his sheep. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The just decrees of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter than honey, and dripping from the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And now the epistle comes to us from the Apostle Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, the first chapter. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now please rise for the gospel. Uh, we hear it from John chapter 2, and it is the text for our message today. Glory to you, O Lord. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, Jesus drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these away do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, 
and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And now let us make confession of our faith as expressed in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated for the singing of the hymn.
pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. Amen. 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 Well, grace and mercy and peace be unto all of you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. A dear redeemed in Christ. You know, I grew up as a pastor's son, and he got a lot of memories from church life, being a pastor's kid. And one of the memories that I have is when my brother, my younger brother, shortly after he received his driver's license, was backing out of a stall at the church parking lot after a Sunday service, and he accidentally ran into a car a nice new car of one of the members and so damaged it pretty well you could imagine well how you would feel if that happened to your car I thought that the uh, gentleman that it happened to handled it pretty well uh, but my father well he was pretty angry at my brother and uh, that's one of those memories that kind of stick in your mind about church and being a pastor's kid. Of course, being in the parking lot isn't quite the same as being in the sanctuary, so to speak. Something like that done in the sanctuary would be even more embarrassing and probably have more reason for anger. And so I think about my father's anger uh, in that event, and then I think about the anger that Jesus displayed uh, in connection with the temple and the temple worship. What the temple was intended for, his father's house. You remember that when Jesus was 12 years old, he was found in the temple answering questions and so forth. And the people were amazed at his understanding. And now, on his way to the cross, uh, Jesus does something that is unique and stands out uh, for, for us all, in that he cleanses the temple. And he shows the anger. He shows righteous anger, okay, uh, for the house of his father the house of the Lord. Now before we develop that a little bit more, let's uh, look at the Old Testament reading. Uh, we have the Exodus reading, the account of the Ten Commandments, the entole, you might, might want to say, the Ten Commandments that God had handed down to Moses and the Israelites and to all the world. Gentiles like you and I included. And so we also see the anger and the threats that are given in connection with disobedience of these commandments, right? Because in there you heard that I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the children of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Yes, a word of judgment and anger, but showing love and mercy to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. So you see, yes, righteous anger on the part of the living God who gave his expectations and commands to all the world, and when people do not care for them or simply discard them, you can understand how the Lord would become angry. Well, let's take the example of the commandment, you shall not murder. Last night I saw a program on 48 Hours about a young lady that was senselessly murdered by a criminal. And so... Her father and mother were searching for her for many days together with the community, and they had found her dead body, 
uh, in a woods there in, in the south. And it just didn't make sense, okay, that this wonderful person uh, would be murdered uh, by a criminal who had done crimes previous to this but was inexplicably out, okay, on parole or whatever. But the command, you shall not murder, you can understand the anger that these parents felt that was in them because of the injustice that had occurred. Now multiply that, okay, over and over again, and consider God's perspective about the injustice and the rebellion and the sin uh, that people display when they ignore his commandments. They want to make them into the ten, ten suggestions, not the commandments. And so think about how the people in the Old Testament, the especially the religious elite, had kind of discarded the import of the Ten Commandments by making hundreds of other kinds of, of laws, okay, that kind of uh, made this into a complex system. Like, for instance, the law concerning the Sabbath. Uh, they came up with how far could you walk on a Sabbath? You couldn't walk as far as you would on other days of the week, but this is, this is only so far you could walk. And so multiply these kinds of hundreds of additions uh, to the commandments that God gave, and you take away the power of it. And people can make excuses for not doing the actual thing that the Lord is expecting of them. And so, you know, the commandments are something that are discarded pretty much in our world today. God's intent is that, you know, we should take these seriously, and if we do, we're going to be blessed in our families and in the congregations and in the community as well. It will filter into the community at large. Yes. But I think that we all recognize today the point that we're in is that we cannot take for granted that there is this penetration into the society of God's perfect moral will. The moral law which God gave to Moses there on Mount Sinai and which is still in effect for each of us. Yes, you can imagine God's anger at disobedience and rebellion against his commands. And you can't blame God for that. No, we can only blame ourselves for our disobedience. Well, think about how Jesus comes to the temple. He's on his way to the cross. He had made the predictions that the Son of Man must suffer and be handed over by sinful men. He must suffer and he must be crucified. And on the third day he will rise again. Jesus had made that prediction over and over again. So he comes to the temple. And what he does is when he sees what's going on, he takes a whip, he makes a whip out of cords, and he starts letting the animals, driving the animals out of the area, and he also turns over the money changing tables. And then he also gives a clear indictment against the people there. When he says, why are you making the house of my father into a market? Or another translation says, a den of thieves. Jesus is angry. And he has the right to be angry. He is God's son. He is equal with the father. And he is showing that righteous anger 
when people get lost with regard to the proper focus and the proper truth. Yes, truth is at stake. God's power is at stake. And Jesus makes this plain. You know, the Passover festival uh, was the connecting thing here. People would come from all over the world, the then known world. They would come into the city of Jerusalem to celebrate that ancient festival. The ancient festival that commemorated God setting the Israelites free from the slavery of Egypt in 1500 B.C. or 1400 B.C. And so every year they were celebrating this festival. And what was required of this festival is that each family would be able to sacrifice an animal, whether an oxen or a lamb or a pigeon or whatever, whatever they could afford. They would sacrifice this animal in commemoration of the Passover festival. And so what would be needed, or what would be needed is an animal, and since there were so many people coming from a far away distance, um, you could understand how people would set up this market. They set it up in the courtyard of the temple, not in the prop in the temple proper, but in the courtyard, kind of like the parking lot that I was talking to you about. But this was also the place where the Gentiles would be allowed to gather on the temple grounds for prayer and worship. They were not allowed into the temple as were the Jews. And so the problem was that they were being interfered with by this market. You know, Isaiah the prophet had said, he had predicted and talked about how the Gentiles uh, would come to the temple of the Lord and how they uh, would be joyful in their worship and prayer. But now this was being mixed because of the situation. The other dynamic going on here is that there would be the need for the exchange of monies. If you've traveled anywhere internationally, you know that you've got to exchange monies, right, in order to make it happen in another culture, in another country. Well, there was exchange necessary for uh, doing business in Jerusalem, especially at the Passover. And so that was an opportunity. You shall not steal, remember? But that was an opportunity where people could take advantage of those traveling worshipers. You remember the tax collectors and how they had cheated people out of money. Well, that too was going on in connection with this. How can you make my father's house into a den of thieves? So Jesus displays this righteous anger and he shows that the improper use of God's house is not going to win the day. Not as long as he's around. And so the people that are there uh, those who are in power, the elite, so to speak, they ask Jesus the question, uh, what sign can you give us? Remember what Paul said? The Jews seek for signs and the Gentiles seek after wisdom. Well, they wanted a sign to demonstrate that Jesus had the authority to do what he just did, how he cleansed the temple. And what does Jesus answer them? He says, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it again, or build it again. Now that's a very specific, messianic prophecy that he is giving shortly before the event of the cross. And remember what Paul said in his epistle, 
we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Paul said, I am determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified because that is the power and the wisdom of God, even though it appears weak and foolish to the unbelieving. Destroy this temple. And they say, well, it took 46 years to rebuild this temple under Herod. How can you say that you can rebuild it in three days? But you know what? Jesus wasn't talking about the physical building. Even though he made the prophecy that 40 years after his time, the temple would be destroyed by the Romans so that not one stone would be left standing on the other. And that came true. But in this prophecy, he wasn't talking about the physical building. He was talking about his body, which is the temple of the Lord. And yes, he is talking about the crucified body that would be on the cross, that would bring deliverance and freedom for all who would believe. And not only that, but he would be raised from the dead on the third day. He would be raised from the dead. And they thought he was talking about that physical structure there. You know what's at the temple site today? It's a mosque. It's a mosque. A Muslim mosque sits there on the temple site. And you know what Jesus said to the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4? Just a couple chapters down from this one. He said, there is a time coming, woman, when those who worship the Father will neither worship him at Mount Gerasim, where the Samaritans call their place of worship, nor will he be worshipped in Jerusalem. But those who worship the Father will worship him in spirit and in truth. Yes. You know, Jesus gave himself up willingly because his Father, really angry over sin, but the beauty of God's love is that God arranged it in such a way that his holy majesty would not be undermined by allowing sin and imperfection. Uh, but yet his mercy would be given to all who would believe through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ the willing sacrifice. It's helpful for us to look at the Gospel of John and to see Jesus as the temple, the priest, and the sacrifice. You see, John's Gospel is structured around the festivals of the Lord, and here we have that Passover festival that really sets the scene for this momentous cleansing of the temple. Yes, Haggai had prophesied that the Lord would return to his temple, and he did. And we see how Jesus cleansed this temple that had been corrupted by man-made policies and man-made ideas. So when you worship in God's house, you know that it's more than just a building. It's more than just pews and altar items. But we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. We worship him through his word and with his sacraments. And wherever that happens, whether in a nice building or no, we have the promise that God is present and active and that he is doing his thing 
his thing of love and forgiveness and salvation for all who would believe. Remember, it can be a stumbling block. It can seem to be foolishness. But to those who are being saved, it is the power and the wisdom of God that God would do this. That God would love the world in this way, that he would give his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. That's in John chapter 3, the next chapter. We'll hear about that next week. So, just wanted to share with you my recollection about anger at the church parking lot so many years ago. But even further back, remember the anger, the righteous anger that Jesus displayed at the temple, at his father's house. Thank you. God, that Jesus has saved us. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever, world without end. Amen. Amen. And may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Now we join in, oh, please rise, and we'll join in the prayer of the church. <coughs> Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O Lord, our jealous God, save the third and fourth generations that will come after us from your punishment by filling us with your son's zeal for your house in these Latin days, that we may cast out every idol from our hearts and love only you and your commandments. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. O Lord, our God, you have brought us out of slavery to sin through Christ Jesus, whom you have made to be our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification, and redemption. Bless all those whom you send to preach Christ crucified to us, that we may ever know and live in the truth of your power in his cross. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O Heavenly Father, preserve and bless all Christian households, that husbands and wives would live in love and service to one another, that fathers and mothers would diligently bring up their children in your fear, and that children would honor their parents and be well equipped for service to their neighbors in this life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, our prayer. prayer. O Lord of the perfect law, you have called us to honor our parents and all other authorities that it might go well with us in our land. Uh, bless all of those who watch over and govern us in your stead. Make them wise in your ways that your justice may be upheld among us and help us to serve and obey them in accord with your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God, whose steadfast love in Christ is good, turn in your abundant mercy uh, to your servants. Uh, we lift up Jerry and Merle as they are dealing with cancer treatment, together with all those who are on our prayer list for various reasons, and all who suffer in our midst. Um, that the flood may not sweep over them, nor the pit close its mouth on them. Deliver them from sinking into the mire and the deep waters, and grant them healing and comfort and peace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. 
O Lord, you bless this day and make it holy with your word and the gifts of your altar. Grant us to come before you in humble repentance to eat your son's body and blood, that we may not boast in ourselves in your presence, but in Christ alone. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, our rock and redeemer, as three days after the temple of your son's body was destroyed by wicked men, he raised it up again. Grant that on the last day we and all the saints who now rest in your presence may share in the glory of his resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated as we join in singing the next hymn, The Law of God is Good and Wise. as we uh, turn to page 208 in our hymnals, but also in our bulletin, the service of the sacrament, the preface, the Lord be with you. And also, also with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We lift, lift them to the Lord. Lord. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us 
when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death, that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and say, Holy, 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 Holy Lord, God, God of Sabi of the door, heaven and earth with full acclaim, shout the glory of your name. Sing Hosanna in the highest, sing Hosanna to the Lord. Truly blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation. For you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. At your command, Abraham prepared to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice on the mountain. Yet in mercy, you provided a ram as a substitute. We give you thanks that on Calvary, you spared not your only son, but sent him to offer his life as a ransom for many. As we eat and drink his body and blood, grant us, like Abraham our father, to trust in your promise now fulfilled in Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also after supper he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. O Jesus Christ, true Lamb of God, you take the sin of the world away. O Jesus Christ, true Lamb of God, have mercy on us, Lord, we pray. O Jesus Christ, true Lamb of God, you take the sin of the world away. Have mercy on us, Jesus Christ, and grant us peace, O Lord, we pray. Now you may be seated as we prepare for the distribution.
please rise to receive the blessing. And now may the true body and blood of our crucified and risen and ascended Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. God's peace and joy be with you. Amen. 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 And now we speak together the words of the Nunc Divinis. O Lord, now let your servant depart in heavenly, heavenly peace, for I have seen the glory of your redeeming grace, a light to lead the Gentiles unto your holy hill, the glory of your people, your chosen Israel. All glory to the Father, all glory to the Son, all glory to the Spirit, forever three in one. For as in the beginning, is now shall ever be, God's divine name resounding through all eternity. We pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And now receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen. Amen.